Welcome to another episode of Team Anywhere, where CEOs, leaders, and experts at building teams, companies, organizations, and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world. I'm your co-host on the East Coast, Ginny Bianco Mathis. And I'm your co-host on the West Coast, Mitch Simon. And we invite you to join us to Team Anywhere. Today on Team Anywhere, we interview Dr. Leanne Davey to learn how to master conflict remotely. Known as the water cooler psychologist, Leanne is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review and frequently called on by media outlets for her experience on leadership, team effectiveness, and productivity. A conflict avoider herself, well, she is Canadian, she has dedicated her life to helping individuals and teams master conflict. Leanne is a New York Times bestselling author of three books, including The Good Fight. Use productive conflict to get your team and your organization back on track. Leanne shares a family camping story, which provided her with a team building solution that we can all use to master conflict remotely. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Team Anywhere. And this is Ginny Bianco Mathis on the East Coast and Mitch Simon on the West Coast. And today we are very excited to have Leon Davey, who is going to speak to us about uh, uh, quite a few topics in her area of expertise of leadership and teams and working remote And she has an incredible amount of tools and guidelines that we really are looking forward to getting out there. She is author of a great book um, called The Good Fight. And she is often um, asked to speak and give wonderful presentations and has written tons of stuff. And that is how I got turned on to her on HBR and the forum and a lot of other places that I have discovered since we spoke. So welcome. Thanks so much, Ginny. And hi, Mitch. Great to be here. Great to see you. Can't wait to hear about the good fight. I could use a good fight right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. Most of us could. (laughs) Great. So Leon, could you just talk to us a little bit about your background and your journey of how you got here and how you um, developed interest in the topics that you're passionate about? Absolutely. I, by way of background, I have a PhD in organizational psychology. And so I guess that's the credentials for where I'm at. But the truth of why I am where I am is probably because I grew up one of those people who really hates conflict. And uh, over time, it turned out that I'm not the only one. And in my work with executive teams, I was starting to recognize that people's discomfort with conflict was getting in the way of good business. And creating a lot of stress. And so that's how I ended up here, which is spending a lot of my time trying to convince people why they need to have more conflict. I know you want the, you want us to have more conflict and I love it. So that, as you said, got you to uh, the good fight. Can you give an overview of that? I mean, why should we read this book? Yeah. So the book is uh, done in three sections. And the first section is really important because that's where I make the case for conflict. So it's pretty easy to, especially in this day and age, what's going on in our political environment, it feels like there's enough conflict in the world. It's very easy to believe that conflict is a bad thing and something we want to avoid. So the book starts with helping us understand what happens to our businesses, to innovation, to risk, what happens to our teams, to trust and engagement, and what happens to us in terms of our stress and our health when we avoid issues that we really need to actually get to the other side of. So that's where it starts. And I dig deep and I I get pretty personal about my own upbringing, my own challenges with uh, conflict aversion. So I start there. 
And then it's about building the skills. Because even if you change your mindset and you embrace productive conflict and you realize it's important, if you if you don't know how to do it well, then conflict can be a very negative thing yeah. and very hurtful. So I spend three chapters in the middle of the book talking about how do you communicate, establish a line of communication? How do you create a connection so that you can have conflict as allies instead of as adversaries? And then how do you contribute to an effective solution in a chapter I call conflict strategies for nice people. Yeah. <laughs> and then the final section of the book goes to the, probably the section I'm most excited about, which is if we rely on always having to have the difficult or the fierce or the crucial conversation, yeah. that's going to burn us all out. <laughs> it's it's much too much to ask. So the final section, I, I teach you how to build a conflict habit, how to create some of the processes and systems that make conflict just a part of everyday life on your team so that it never gets to these big blow ups or these fierce conversations. We actually have conflict a lot more frequently, but with much lower impact. So that conflict habit section is something that I'm really proud of and I think is the antidote to conflict being such a negative for us. And then I threw in a bonus section I called Try This at Home, which applies the ideas of how to have a good fight with your partner, oh. with your children, in your volunteer organizations. So that that was a bonus, but I, I had a lot of fun and, and often end up talking about those ideas as well. Fabulous. Could you give us an example of um, what are the ways to build that infrastructure for yourself, the third part of the book? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wrote an article about this in Harvard Business Review because I thought it was so important to just share with people these techniques. So one of the most important is to normalize conflict, particularly what I would call productive tensions. So I tell a story, it's a silly story, uh, but it, it's a new metaphor that I think is helpful in thinking about it. Because one of the problems is our metaphors for conflict or for teams today come from rowing. So we talk about being in the same boat. We talk about pulling in the same direction. And so when someone goes to disagree, the, the poster on the wall is suggesting that's not a good idea, the language we use. So I was looking for a new story and a new metaphor, and it came from a camping trip that I went on with my family many years ago. And we actually ended up in this huge rainstorm, and we needed to go buy a plastic tarpaulin to try and cover, <laughs> cover our tent. And there were four of us, my husband and our two daughters, and we were you know, trying to spread this tarp out and, and get it really tight so the rain would roll off of it and also get it centered over the tent to provide as much protection as possible. And my husband kept pulling so hard, he sent our five-year-old like flying into, into a mud puddle. And at some point, our other daughter, who at the time was about nine, got fed up and, and let go. And the corner of the tarp went flying up, leaving the tent getting soaked. And, and, you know, many years later, I had this epiphany that this tarp is actually a much better metaphor for teamwork than rowing is. Okay. Actually, we're not pulling in the same direction as our teammates when we're doing our jobs. You know, the head of sales is paying attention to diff something different than the head of operations. Um, but what we are trying to do is put roughly the same amount of tension on things, never pulling so hard that we either... Uh, you know, pull the decision off target, making sure yeah. that the customers or the, the shareholders get soaked in the tent. Um, and also never being so afraid of conflict or fed up with conflict that we actually just let go and, and leave something exposed. So this silly story has has been very helpful for people. And so we built an exercise around it. And there's a, a template and a way of going around and saying, what are each of the roles on our team, um, or what, as we call them, the ropes on the tarp? And then we ask three questions. And you can do, I, I really encourage your listeners, do this with your team. It's so such an epiphany when you do it. The first question, uh, what's the unique value of your role? And what's the expertise and the experience your role brings that no other role on the team brings? Secondly, what stakeholders does your role represent? Because, you know, sales is thinking about the customer, 
sometimes the product people or the marketing people are thinking about the consumer, and those can be different people. Um, you know, operations is thinking about finances. Somebody else is thinking about the regulator. Or <laughs> there's all different stakeholders, and understanding which stakeholder a particular role is advocating for helps you understand why they might be in tension with you. And then the final question is. What is your obligation to disagree? What's the tension you're obliged to put on conversations? Um, so the salesperson is obliged to fight for the customer, to fight for a flexible, different, interesting, differentiated uh, product. And the operations person is obliged to put tension on that, to say, hang on, we can't be creating something new for every customer. We go bankrupt and right, right. you know that's not efficient in our factory or... Um, and once you answer those three questions for each of the roles, first of all, it's funny to hear what people say. You know, you get all sorts of hilarious things come out of people's mouths like, oh, I thought you were just a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, right. God, this is your job. <laughs> you, you get funny comments. But the empathy that then is created and in the next decision, you start to see people saying, OK, well, we haven't even heard from the quality person yet. And, and so what's that angle on this decision? Um, they start understanding the dynamic tension of these different roles. So when we do that exercise with people, they get a much better better outcome and they start to normalize. So the next time it happens, when the ops guy says, you know, I ain't taking that order for, you know, that whole bunch of ribs that you want me to, you know, do that's going to ruin our scrap rates on the line. I'm not doing it. When that happens, instead of interpreting it as friction, interpersonal friction, and we don't like each other or he's a jerk, uh, you interpret it as that productive tension that's supposed to be there. That's how you make an optimal decision for the organization and how you make sure nobody in the tent gets wet. So that's one of the exercises that really makes a huge difference. It is written up in Harvard Business Review, and yeah. I'm always happy if people need more instructions, they can just shoot me a note and happy to provide any more clarification. Oh, that's, yeah, that's we'll fabulous. Put, we'll put Go notes ahead. on how to, how to get to that, uh, awesome. Harvard Business Review article. I love, I pretty much read Harvard Business Review every day. So I love it. Um, the question I have for you is, is we, we've actually had, um, we've addressed this on some, um, earlier podcasts is, okay. So, you know, I was on a team where we didn't, have, we didn't have a lot of conflict or we, we did, but it wasn't really great. And now I'm um, dispersed. We're not together in a room. We're probably not going to be together in a room for, for, for a while. How am I supposed to engage and, and, I don't know, shift the whole culture of my team? Um, how do I engage in conflict when I'm just not next to these people and, and I should, in fact, be caring about them and their, you know, their, their situation? Um, can't we just all be friends? And so I guess, you know, that's, that's what I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit. Yeah, it's hard because our norms are for the most part that we wait till we're face to face to have difficult or uncomfortable conversations. And right. so there are a lot of people who are scheduling in that argument for January, 2022. <laughs> I'm right. ready. I'm going to, that's going to um, be a very busy day. Right. And here's the problem. The way the human brain works is that once we have that interaction that we're feeling uncomfortable with, um, once we've jumped to a conclusion like, you know, Frank turned off his camera while I was presenting, he was obviously not listening or not interested. Once we jump to these conclusions, which we do, every single interaction you have with Frank from here until that January 2022 meeting um, is going to be through that lens of that resentment and that baggage you already have. So people will often ask me, yeah, but Leanne, shouldn't you pick your battles? And I say, well, it depends. So yes, you should pick your battles, but here's the problem. If what you're saying is, um, I'm not going to let that go, I'm just not going to deal with it, then no, that's terrible advice. And we can talk about that. That's where we get into conflict debt. Um, but if you are if you are legitimately able to say, you know what, it's COVID, 
People are really stressed. He might have just been turning off his camera because his kid was streaking naked through the back of the screen. I'm fine. I'm not going to jump to a conclusion. Yes, of course, pick that battle. But unfortunately, it turns out that most of the time uh, we make judgment. That judgment affects the next email we get, the way we read it. I always say emails have narrators. And we decide if we're narrating it as Darth Vader sending us an email (laughs) Or as Princess Leia sending us an email. And so if you've had an unsavory interaction with a teammate, uh, you're going to read their next email differently. And once you read their next email differently, you're going to engage with them differently in the next call. And so the biggest thing we have to remember during these times is that letting things fester is going to add to your stress. As Nelson Mandela said, resentment is uh, you swallowing poison, hoping they'll die. (laughs) <laughs> and, and we don't need any more poison, any more stress during COVID. Um, so it it is important to overwrite that code that we all have, which is have hard conversations in person, and we need to start engaging them. I did a YouTube video, and we can link to that as well, about how do you yeah, have conflict sure. remotely. Um, turns out oh, there's some huge advantages to having conflict remotely, like you can prepare And you can make notes to yourself (laughs) that you can refer to, which, you know, when you're in the middle of a fight with someone in the office and you're looking at the notes on your hand, you look like a bit of a dork. But, (laughs) you know, when you're sitting at your computer, it's easy. Um, So there are some advantages. So that's the most important advice. So if you truly can uh, be empathetic, be generous, uh, let something go because we are all under a lot of stress and this isn't normal fine. But don't kid yourself that you're picking your battles if really you're going to uh, judge the other person, hold it against them, and just not give them the chance to do anything about it because you're not going to tell them for 18 months. So yeah, if, I, if I wanted you. to, if I wanted to have conflict with you, Leanne, and um, let's say you did something to me and I wanted to engage in conflict with you around it, how would I even begin to do that? Because you know, you're in Toronto and I'm here in San Diego and we've got to do this, do this through Zoom. What would be like a couple steps that I would take to have conflict with you and, and make this turn out okay? Yeah. So I think the the first thing is to think about how do I set this up so we can have this conversation as allies? Because ultimately okay. we're on the same team, we're on the same side, right? So um, the first thing is you've been thinking about it. And you've had Mm -hmm. the opportunity to prepare your examples and know just why you feel so wronged. And I haven't. So this is contrary to my most conventional wisdom, but I would encourage you to shoot a quick note, um, not to get into the argument, but to actually give me a chance to center myself, to know what's coming, to collect my own examples. So you might send me a quick email and say, um, I've been thinking about our meeting on Tuesday And I'm uncomfortable with how we left the conversation about the ACME project. I'd love a chance to talk voice to voice with you or face to face with you about it. Can we make time? So that email just gives me enough to know, okay, there's something going on. I know what the topic is roughly. And so I can collect my thoughts and it's not going to feel like somebody jumping out of the bushes at me on a call, which that's a lot more likely to trigger a defensive and emotional reaction if it takes me by surprise. So start there. Then when you get on the call, if, if you are uncomfortable with it, name the uncomfort. I didn't know if I should even raise this. Um, you know, it was a one-time thing. But it just wasn't sitting right with me. And I really, um, I owe you the courtesy of telling you this is what I'm thinking. So framing the conversation, first of all, to to express that you're uncomfortable so that they're a little bit careful with you and they, right, they know that. And also that you're going to be a little careful with them. Um, And, you know, just setting it up as let's have this conversation as allies Um, that's another really important thing. So you might also then, uh, what you're always trying to do is get the other person's truth before imposing your truth. So I might then move to a question. So how did you feel about that conversation? And and where do you think we left it? And um, how did you feel, you know, how do you feel three days later? Those sorts of things. That's going to give you a lot of information to work from, and it's going to give you the chance to ask some questions and get at the point where you can then say back to them their truth. Then you've earned the right. So that's the most important thing. When you speak someone else's truth before you speak your own, you earn the right to share your truth and to have conflict as an ally. So that point you might say, 
okay, I'm really glad that you shared that with me. Um, and you know, I was thinking about it differently. Here's how I was thinking about it. And you can share your own truth before you then say, okay, where do we go from here? Um, I, I really want this to work. I'm really invested in this. My sense is you're really invested in this. Uh, You know, what might we do differently to move from here? You know, those kinds of questions. So, you know, first of all, giving a heads up, really important. Um, getting into the conversation and naming the emotional reaction you're having, if you're having one, uh, and then soliciting their truth and paraphrasing it back to them before adding your own and figuring out, okay, if those are the two truths, that's your truth and my truth, uh, where do we go from here? So it, it's not worse. And, and in some ways, it can be a little bit easier when you're doing it through the computer. There's a little bit of emotional distance, a little bit of protection and safety that I can't punch you. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and you can be wearing your favorite slippers or whatever while you're doing it. So uh, I just really encourage you to say, don't let things fester during COVID. We have enough contagion in the world right now. We don't need that emotional contagion of issues that we're upset or resentful about. You know, and, you know oh, go ahead. Go ahead, um, um, Kitty. Don't you wish you can just clone her, right? You know, just, yeah, right now. Just, yeah, all, every Canadian all, should be cloned. There's just the not words, enough of them. Yeah. I think um, they're going to take away my Canadian citizenship for for promoting more conflict. It's very off brand. But yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm doing my bit. Oh, this yeah, is like, great. The only Canadian in the world promoting conflict right now. Uh, so, so true. So true. <clears throat> so here's a leader, and um, he or she is now dealing in this remote world, and he's read your book or she's read your book and is is trying to practice this stuff. And he um, or she is running this team. <clears throat> Maybe three or four people have interacted with her before. How does she create this kind of let's um, be use healthy conflict, a good fight, as a team norm? Right. Yeah. Of course, they can role model it here and they can role model it there. And yet I would be feeling a need to get everyone on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. So I really recommend using the TARP exercise uh, as as one way of, um, it, it makes a great way to spend an hour in a team meeting. And especially in this virtual world, it's a great team building activity that you can do online. So I would highly encourage that. Uh, the other thing is to talk very specifically about Uh, where are the places and what are the ways in which our team benefits from productive conflict? Um, So get the team talking, you know, uh, how does it help us in our decision-making? How does it help us better understand diverse stakeholders that we have? How does it help us innovate? Um, And so building out the business case for your specific team, not my language, not, you know, not anybody else's language, but creating your own language. And then, you know, finishing that conversation with some really pithy, short norms or ground rules about conflict. Um, you know, the, the one that, um, I love is the Amazon rule around disagree and commit. And there's actually more words to it in the Amazon one. It's like, have the courage to disagree and commit or something like that. Um, But it's such a great one because it says everybody in this organization has an obligation to disagree. Even if you don't disagree, uh, you're there to put tension on the ideas, to stress test them, to make sure that they're right. And once we have made the decision, you have an obligation to commit to making that decision successful. So those words, disagree and commit, are so important in that organization. And you can create your own versions uh, on your team. And maybe two or three is all you need where you have this conversation about the benefits, you have a conversation about what's allowed and not allowed, you have the conversation about the TARP so you understand how people people's roles affect this. And then you sum it up with, you know, here's our two or three bumper sticker type statements that are going to guide our behavior. Uh, And it makes a wonderful team building session. Yes, that's perfect. I love it. Yeah. And also, it also sounds like one thing a manager could do 
especially since we're not in the same room, is to say, okay, so now that we've discussed this area, this is the this is the disagreement part of our of our meeting right now. So I need for everyone to kind of share with me where they don't agree with what I just said. Um, and Absolutely. We don't have a conflict culture established. And I also tell this to Canadian clients. I say, ask for it as a favor. So uh, if people don't like to disagree with the boss, uh, things like that, and very true in Asian cultures, there are lots of or places where there's big power differentials. Um, as the manager, ask for it as a favor. I really need your help. I really need to anticipate where there might be some resistance to this plan. What might upset people about this? What might people say uh, counter to this plan? So asking for it as a favor uh, is really useful. And then you can also ask it as a hypothetical. That's another way of adding a little emotional distance for people who don't like conflict. If somebody were to have a problem with this, what might it be? And again, you just create enough emotional distance that they can tell you. They'll usually start the sentence with like, this isn't me. Uh, like, I, I don't think this, but but <laughs> here's what it might look like. Um, so those are some techniques you can use to encourage that spot in the meeting where you switch to, okay, this is the time where we're really going to go at it for a little bit, Put some te- pull those ropes on the tarp, uh, put some tension on these ideas to, to make them better. Yeah. Another thing that I was uh, present to was the fact that because, because we are distant, that you could, you could approach it to say, well, you know, Leanne, you and I had a meeting last week and of course we're not in the same room. And, and so I'm, I just wanted to call to check something out in order to, in order to come at it from a way of I'm mad. And I know that I, I know why I'm mad ver- versus I just need to check something out. I'm just really curious. Are, are you in the same place that I'm in? Cause I do think that one of the things about the hardest thing about conflict is usually we think that we know why something is bad or wrong or different. And I would say to leverage, leverage this space of distance to say, well, we're not in the same room. So I just, I don't think I fully understood. Let's kind of figure this out. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the more space and time you can make for one another to just have those casual conversations. One of the things I'm noticing about team meetings via the web is Uh this medium tends to make us get down to business very quickly. So when you walk into a meeting room, there's almost always five minutes of small talk where people are settling in and then somebody sits down and gets back up to get water or (laughs) like there's that time. It's under 30 seconds on web calls, I'm finding. So bring that time back in, right? Say, you know, everybody, you know, comes into the room starting at the top of the hour. Uh, The business begins at five after or 10 after. Um, Those sorts of things so that we can start to have the like, hey, what what do you think of that? Or, you know, those sorts of check-in moments that we haven't had and finding opportunities to do that through other means. So you have a coffee room, like a Zoom room that's permanently just the coffee room. That's even the URL, right, is the coffee room. And people can jump in there and go see if anyone's in there and have informal conversations. So we need to bring back that time to suss one another out and just kind of feel, feel out where people are on things because we've lost a lot of that, um, through this very, so I'm actually finding there's some big productivity enhancements of working remotely, but those productivity gains are coming at the expense of the more subtle, nuanced kind of communication. Totally. That, that is great. And that's how you bring in the, um, the humanity again. Um, yeah. And, and we do. So I was talking to uh, a friend last night and she's, um, she's a comedian and also a keynote speaker and, a and she does a lot of stuff in the workplace. And she was just asking what I was seeing. And I said, I'm just seeing from my clients that we have become joyless. Um, oh. we've become humorless and we're coping with COVID, I think incredibly well. And, and for the most part, quite impressively, uh, at the cost of any joy in our work at the moment, uh, there is just this efficiency to it there. It's, you know, it was interesting. I read a great study of what's happened in the U S patent and trademarks office post COVID, and they've seen 
because they have such clear ways of measuring output, so the number of patent files reviewed and the number of trademark files, they've seen a 14%, no, 13% increase in productivity uh, with working remotely. They can measure it. 9% of that is from the fact that people are working more hours. They have just taken their commute time and plowed it into working. Um, the good news is 4% of it is true productivity gains from reduced distraction of working remotely, et cetera, et cetera. But um, all of that is a great formula for productivity, but not a great formula from, for camaraderie, for long-term uh, resilience and all those other things. So we got to bring the joy back. Um, I, I want to yeah, do that thing where you pay for an elephant to join your, your meeting. Uh, that's going to be my next one. There's an elephant sanctuary in Thailand. You can pay to have the elephant join your meeting. And I, I've been in so many meetings with an elephant in the room, but I've never been in a meeting with an elephant in the oh, room. I love it. Yes. Yeah, I yeah, think well, gonna... Excellent. That's great. And so you sort of answered this. Maybe you can elaborate just a little bit. What are you doing in the meetings that you're holding? Um, along this line, it sounds like you're trying to do some upfront things to to bring the joy back. Mm -hmm. um, Mostly trying to slow things down a little bit. So there is this um, drive and cadence in online meetings that I think is a little too fast. So we push too hard to get to closure and we converge too quickly. So as a facilitator, the biggest advantage I can bring is, you know, just as people are starting to converge, I can throw something in that <laughs> puts a wrench in it. Or I can say, are, are we there already? Uh, uh, you know, can we take one more round on that? Or, you know, I've just been reflecting on not what we just talked about, but how we talked about it. How well, did that feel for everybody, one. right? Yeah, so yeah. a lot of what I'm doing is putting some speed bumps in because, you know, everybody is driving as if they're in a straightaway. And some of the decisions we're making during this time are actually more like hairpin turns. And so yeah. if I can slow people down a little bit, uh, make them think both about the, the what, but also the how. Um, that's the best thing in meetings right now. Just adding a little oxygen to the meeting because there, there isn't enough. It, it just seems to be, we, we were already in February, we were already feeling what the cadence of this business environment is like, and it, it was already too much. It's just worse now. Um, so we have to make some more space. So the more you can do little things to slow it down, uh, the better. That's, that needs to be your next blog. That <laughs> No, I think I think you're right. This straight away now, yeah. we need to put something else in it. We'd like to take this brief interruption to thank our sponsors and then get back to our program. We'd like to thank Marymount University, Arlington, Virginia, School of Business and Technology, Innovative Solutions, Upskilling for the What's Next Economy at marymount.edu. Oyster Organizational Development, dedicated to higher performance, business success, and leveraging teams at OysterOD.com. And WeJungo, a strategic people process consulting firm at WeJungo.com. Yeah. So that brings me to a, a final question around your own growth and movement and insights. Um, what journey have you been on? Yeah, that that's a great point. So when when uh, Canada issued its international lockdown, my family and I were in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> it was wow. a bit stressful trying to, our flights got canceled and we were not just in Costa Rica. Like we were in middle of nowhere, Costa Rica that needed a, a ferry and a, this, it was planes, trains, and automobiles to get our family back. Um, and I was, well, let's just among friends say I was freaking out. Um, <laughs> And uh, my husband, we left our kids at the Airbnb and we went and hiked a waterfall and got up to the top of this gorgeous waterfall in the jungle. And I sat there and in a moment of calm, I remembered Rahm Emanuel's line about never let a crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not going to waste this crisis. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to grow. I'm going to. Um, and so... I think the most important thing I've realized by hunkering down, so I had 26 flights between the 1st of January and the 20th of March. I was always on the road. I was, and now I've been, you know, with my family grounded, 
um, for seven months. And the biggest thing I realized is that I was running someone else's race and I was uh, judging myself against people who have very different purposes in the world than I do. And when I realized that this conflict message, the messages of resilience and the things we can do to make work have a more meaningful impact on our lives, that's my work. And the more I focus on that and the less I worry about what other people are doing or who's giving keynotes to bigger audiences or who's working with companies higher on the Fortune 500 list, the better. (laughs) And the more I can make space to serve the people that I I think I can add some value for. And it was just so interesting because so many people just kind of dropped out and other people became so much more precious to me. Um, And I think it's been a reckoning for a lot of us about what was I doing? Who was I in a relationship with? What activities was I pursuing? All in search of something that doesn't really matter and what really matters. And so now I'm just so obsessed with this idea that, you know, there are many, many, many hard things about work and particularly about teamwork. And if I can take my background in psychology, take my experience, take my writing and direct all of that to um, helping people better communicate, better connect and better contribute so they can achieve amazing things together, that that's what matters most. And then at 5.30, turn off the computer, bake a loaf of bread, <laughs> be with my family. Um, so COVID's actually been been a gift, thankfully, because we've been able to stay healthy and um, we've been able to rebound our business. Yeah. And um, it, it's been a gift. I love it. I love it. And I, uh, Mitch and I appreciate that you have included us <laughs> in your yes, focus. Yes, we have. Um, Absolutely, what good and what to share and Absolutely. spread out into the world. Yes, yeah, because we we really, you know, Judy and I started this podcast for the same reason, which is okay. It's time to stop, reflect, and yeah, we want to give we want to give solutions for people who are dispersed. Yeah, we also want to bring you know hope and meaning for this time that we're going through and finding ways like you're saying. Well, you know what? Maybe there's there's benefits of being dispersed to handle the things that are not so easy. Yeah. And maybe this, um, this time is time for you to just look at the conflict within yourself to say, what do you really, really want? Because you have more time and you are for many of us surrounded by the people we really, really love, which, which makes it more graceful. Well, gosh, you're now my new favorite Canadian. (laughs) Thank you so much. And Jenny, why don't we take them home? Totally. Thank you so much again. And um, the uh, folks can get your book, I assume, on Amazon. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you mentioned a, a pod. Uh, um, a YouTube video so I can ser- about how to have conflict remotely. So I'm happy to give you the link to that as well right. if people want just a little more detail and a little more practice. Absolutely. Great. So, great. so we'll, uh, we'll put your, your website, your your video, the HBR article, a link to the book. People will all find right. it. Set again soon, knives. All in the comments. <laughs> That's right. That's the second That's place. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you uh, for all our great listeners for another episode of Team Anywhere. 